Dean of the University of Alabama School of Law, I'm delighted to welcome you to this, the 10th annual presentation of the Harper Lee Prize for Legal Fiction. From the beginning, we've awarded the Harper Lee Prize during the week of the National Book Festival, which is sponsored by the Library of Congress. We are pleased to be able to do so again this year, even if virtually, and we're grateful for our continuing and felicitous relationship with the Library of Congress, which is one of the world's truly great institutions dedicated to the importance of knowledge in a democratic society. In establishing the prize, Nell Harper Lee sought to honor, in her words, a published book-length work of fiction that best exemplifies the role of lawyers in society and their power to effect change. This year's winner is The Hallows by Victor Mythos. It's a worthy winner. The Hallows describes the journey of Tatum Graham, a celebrated criminal defense attorney who, for reasons he doesn't fully comprehend, becomes deeply disillusioned, leaves his lucrative legal practice, and makes his way to a town in southern Utah, a town in which he had grown up and from which he had fled as soon as he was able. He was hard-bitten in life, cynical about his family, about the tortured years of his youth, about the claustrophobia of his hometown. He was cynical too about law, describing it as a kind of war in which the sole virtue was winning and winning had no connection to justice. In reckoning with his past and with a new job in Utah, this time as a prosecutor, he came to recognize that the past is never dead, that the dead can consecrate the present, and that his deepest self had all along yearned to connect law with justice. In important ways, this story is not merely about a lawyer's impact on society, or at least a small town slice of society, though it is about that. It's also about the power of law to effect change in the individual lawyer. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce the winner of the 2020 Harper Lee Prize for Legal Fiction, Victor Mythos. Hello, Victor Mythos here. Uh, I am excited to be virtually speaking with everybody today. Um, and thank you so much for having me here. Uh, first, before anything else, I would like to thank the University of Alabama and the committee who took time out of their lives to read these works. I'm truly flattered to be even considered for this award, uh, much less actually win it. Uh, because I remember the first time I read To Kill a Mockingbird, I was maybe 12 or 13 and my best friend had just been arrested for a crime that he didn't commit, um, even though the police got a confession from him. Um, and I knew he was innocent because I knew the boys at our school who actually committed this crime. But he was arrested and he went through our justice system and I just watched slowly as his life unraveled after his arrest to the point where he became suicidal. And I was just filled with so much anger you know, and, and just this feeling of helplessness uh, that the government could do this to somebody who was innocent. But I was just a kid, obviously. I, I couldn't do anything. Uh, and then a couple of months later, just by chance, I happened to stumble across a copy of To Kill a Mockingbird at the local library and decided to give it a read. And I saw what a criminal defense lawyer was. I didn't, I didn't know that was a profession up until then. And I saw what it looked like, looks like to have integrity in that profession. And I really was not the same kid uh, after I read that book. Um, and my fate was sealed, so to speak. Uh, I went on to become a criminal defense lawyer, a profession which I very much love and respect. Um, so to think that the committee saw something of this book that changed my life and affected me so profoundly, to think that they saw some of that in my own work is just shocking. And I am truly, truly humbled. I'm so grateful and honored for this award. And thank you so much. Uh, so I hope you're all staying safe out there. Thank you. If you would, a round of virtual applause for our winner, Victor Mythos. Mr. Mythos, I understand it's our tradition to actually physically present uh, uh, a crystal award and a signed volume of To Kill a Mockingbird. Uh, I, I trust that you've received those. I have, yes, they haven't left my side, so. Here's the award and the amazing, I almost passed out when I saw her signature. It was like a kid meeting like, you know, their, their baseball hero or something. So I am so grateful for this. Before we do anything else, I just want to thank the committee again. I, I was a judge for the Edgar Awards and I know what it's like to have to 
not spend time with your family or work to read the works of these authors that you're helping out. And I truly am grateful and I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you for the privilege of letting us consider the book. And uh, it w it's, uh, it's been a real pleasure actually to engage with, with, with this really fine uh, book. So it's a privilege at this point to introduce uh, what, what is also a tradition for us, and that's a, a panel discussion of uh, the Hallows. Uh, our esteemed panelists are um, well qualified to talk about the book, not only because they were part of the selection committee, but they also happen to have experience and expertise that are uh, really valuable in the uh, fleshing out of themes that are relevant to the to, to this fine novel. Um, and I'll just introduce them briefly in alphabetical order. Alelia Bundles is uh, an extraordinary author of biographies of some extraordinary women in her own family. And uh, I think you're on your uh, fifth book presently about uh, uh, your grandmother in the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, she spent 30 years as an executive and Emmy Award winning producer at both ABC News and NBC News. She's a trustee of Columbia University and chair emerita of the National Archive Foundation. Dr. James Crank, is Associate Professor of American Literature and Culture at the University of Alabama. Uh, he was a summer fellow at the uh, Distinguished National Humanities Center and was co-host of the podcast, The Sound and the Furious, to do a riff on Faulkner, I guess. He's also been a contributor to the BBC and to the PBS show, The Great American Read, and his essays have appeared in a number of distinguished literary journals. Uh, Jesse J. Holland is an award-winning author and journalist. Uh, his novel, Black Panther, who is the Black Panther, uh, was nominated for an NAACP Image Award in 2019. He teaches, teaches journalism at Georgetown and creative nonfiction at Goucher, which uh, was uh, your MFA alma mater, uh, is currently serving as distinguished visiting scholar in residence at the Library of Congress, and in his spare time hosts the weekend edition of C-SPAN's uh, Washington Journal. David Mao, who is not new to this event, uh, is Associate Vice President for Administration and Chief Operating Officer for Georgetown University Law Center. The move to Georgetown was preceded by a distinguished career at the Library of Congress where he started as first deputy uh, uh, law librarian then served as the 23rd Law Librarian of Congress uh, and then was appointed acting Librarian of Congress. His, his move to Georgetown is actually a return to Georgetown since he took his law degree at the Georgetown uh, University Law Center. And last but certainly not least uh, is uh, C.E. Tobisman, uh, Cindy, uh, who is a practicing lawyer. Uh, she took her JD from what was then uh, Bolt Hall School of Law at UC Berkeley, uh, where she was a member of uh, the Moot Court Board and the Berkeley Women's Law Journal. She's now a first rate appellate litigator uh, with a prominent appellate for, uh, firm in Los Angeles. Uh, she's also a splendid novelist and was winner of the 2018 Harper Lee Prize for legal fiction for a really quite fine book uh, proof. So thank you all for being here uh, today to celebrate Victor Mithos and his uh, book, The Hallows. So let's get started. Um, I will try to direct questions to individual uh, panelists, but I encourage all of you to feel free to uh, kibitz, uh, and I'll encourage Mr. Mithos as well to, to weigh in. 
uh, as he feels moved to do so. And I may give him a few last words uh, before we part company today. So, um, uh, David Mao, may I start with you? Um, so, uh, we heard uh, earlier that uh, in establishing the ward, Nell Harper Lee had wanted to uh, honor a, uh, a work of fiction that, in her words, best exemplifies the role of lawyers in society and their power to affect change. I wonder if you'd reflect on the ways in which the uh, Hallows achieves what Ms. Lee set out to, to, to honor. Certainly, um, and congratulations again to our winner. Um, now that we're formally getting to meet you in person, uh, I, I really appreciate it. I really enjoyed reading your novel, and I do think it ex exemplifies what uh, Harper Lee was trying to establish for us. Um, and I'd like to tie it back, if I may, to the reason that the uh, prize itself is um, aligned with the Library of Congress and for my many years of service at the Library of Congress. And if we think of the Library of Congress as um, an institution for really knowledge and the pursuit of knowledge, I think really what um, Ms. Lee was trying to say is that um, understanding um, the impact of a role of a lawyer is really like learning. And so we see it in two ways. One with uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, it was through the eyes of scout um, and as a young child. And so we saw it that way of learning and really beginning on that trajectory of learning and what you can do with your life. And um, conversely, I see it as a bookend with um, our current prize winner, someone who has already gone through all of that and is on the other end of the spectrum and reflecting back on all of the things that they've learned um, and still learning um, and in that pursuit of knowledge and in a specific instance of, of learning about law and the impact of law and on society. And so that's what I would say is um, really, I think, um, a, a good reason that I thought of as the, the novel itself, um, reflecting on what um, the intent of uh, Harper Lee was for, for her, um, for this prize. Thank you for that. Yeah, uh, Jesse Holland, I'd be interested in, in your thoughts about that as well. Yeah, one of the things that we as a society and especially as a literary community, uh, we tend to fall back on is the common tropes of storytelling. But with The Hollows, we saw a novel that moved away from the only the inside the courtroom life of lawyers, where it, The Hollows took us outside of the old courtroom drama and moved us to law and life at the same time. And that for a lot of people who we enjoy the inside the courtroom drama, but law is about more than just sitting in a trial. And the hollows helped us with its story by exemplifying the outside of the courtroom, using, using the real world to talk about law instead of just inside the, the courthouse, which made it a worthy choice for me. I want to talk about a character in the in the book, uh, or a kind of character in the book, Alelia Bundles. If you'll help me with this, um, in the Hallows, as in uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, uh, the towns themselves are kind of significant: River Falls, Utah, uh, uh, and Macomb, Alabama. Both small towns, but uh, very different each. Uh, from the other. Um, they're not just settings, uh, it seems to me, uh, uh, but they do take on a kind of character and that and, and the character of the towns is relevant to the unfolding of the uh, uh, dramatic narrative in each. And uh, I wonder if you could talk about the thematic roles of, uh, of place in, uh, in these narratives. Mr. Mithos, um, you know, you really are masterful at creating a sense of place. And I didn't read your personal bio until after I had read the book. So that's some, you know, you, you should not do that because you don't want to know a whole lot about the author beforehand. You want the book to speak for itself. But when I learned of your own personal journey, that helped uh, inform for me why you perhaps are so excellent at 
being able to create a place and put yourself in a place. So your personal journey, I think, added to it. And I, you know, just as in the setting in To Kill a Mockingbird, you took the, you know, you created class and race and personality, the good and evil, the secrets, the secret places, the community fissures, um, the seated and the exalted. So I just, I really thought you did a great job of taking us, you know, not just to River Falls, but Miami and Las Vegas and different parts of each city. So I really appreciated how you drew us in in that way. I appreciate that. Thank you. So it, it, it does strike me that um, some of the greatest insights about society can come from persons who see the society as an outsider. Uh, and uh, it, um, I read an interview with Truman Capote at one point, and he, he, he was, of course, a, ch a childhood friend of uh, Nell Harper Lee, and he, he, he described himself and Harper Lee as what he called apart people, uh, meaning that he and she were kind of in Monroeville, Alabama, but not of it. And they saw themselves as um, outsiders, uh, uh, even though they, in a physical sense, were not outsiders, or a cultural sense, maybe not outsiders. Uh, uh, you're, 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 to, to, to uh, follow up on uh, Alelia's point, I, was struck by your biography as well. You immigrated to the United States when you were still uh, pretty young. Uh, and I'm wondering about your own thoughts about your own biography and it's uh, and your experience and the relevance of that experience to your being able to see uh, American society with uh, uh, kind of fresh eye, the fresh eyes of a stranger in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it certainly, it impacts everything I write. Um, I've always said that the outsiders have the best view. So the most patriotic people I know are immigrants because we know how bad it, how bad it can get, right? So I still actually remember the first day I came to America. Um, I'd lived in, a, I was living in a refugee camp at the time and our ration was one yogurt a day. So that's what I was living on is just one yogurt a day. So we landed and my uncle met us at the airport who already lived here and we're driving through Manhattan. And because it's Manhattan, I looked over and I saw a gentleman just urinating on the sidewalk. And I remember leaning over to my mom and saying, mom, Americans are so free. They can pee wherever they want to. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then, and then my uncle took us to Benihana's, right? So like fish is bursting into flames. There's meat cleavers being juggled. And so I was just, I thought I had died and gone to heaven. I was like, this is the most, America is the most magical place in the universe. And that sense has never left me. Um, the first thing I do when I get up in the morning, is I just say, thank you. Thank you for letting me live here. It's just the, the sense of gratitude I have for being in this country and being able to become a citizen was just enormous. And so looking at the justice system too, um, it really has, it's, it's colored my view of the justice system as well, because I've seen what justice systems are like outside of the United States. In, in Afghanistan, there's a joke actually that the minister, that you don't get a trial, the minister sits and writes whether guilty or not guilty on your file. So the joke is that he's writing Guilty, guilty. How do you spell not guilty? Ah, never mind. Guilty, guilty. So, <laughs> so in the United States, you get a trial for a speeding ticket. It's incredible. It's an it's an incredible justice system, and I'm always awed by it whenever I partake in it. It strikes me that uh, um, compared with the magic that you saw when you arrived, uh, River Falls is a distinctly unmagical place. Um, talk, talk to us about that. What, what did Scout say? I remember Scout saying when she described. Make them. It was something like it's old, dingy, and suffocating, right? So there are towns I live by that are very old, dingy, and suffocating, with filled with uh, people who held views from you know fifty or sixty years ago that were prominent at that time. So River Falls is really just an exploration of of those towns. When I go through those towns, I still see. I mean, it's like stepping back into the nineteen sixties, and I always find that interesting that there's little pockets in the United States that really haven't evolved with the rest of society. So that's really River Falls. It's just a place that just chose one epoch, stayed there and just refuses to evolve. Mark, if you don't mind me jumping in here, that was one of the things that really attracted me to the book was the coming home theme. Because for example, there are a lot of us, like for example, I'm from Mississippi. And so I come from one of those little towns that, you're, that you were just talking about. 
And I, when I go back, I feel the exact same things uh, at home. And I come back to where I live now. I was like, wow, that was really, yeah. So I could really connect with the theme of going back home and not recognizing the place that you came from and not recognizing the person you used to be, which I felt heavily in reading The Hollows. And it was a great exploration that I, was, that I really was able to connect with almost immediately. But it seems like one of the interesting aspects of it is you have a main character who's then affirmatively deciding to go put himself back in that backwards place and try to find, kind of recontextualize himself in a another epoch, maybe with a goal of recognizing that that place too has worth and can move forward, but it's going to take people with different perspectives to decide that they're, you know, they're the son of that town and they may have a unique, like Atticus Finch, have a unique ability to act as the moral compass of a place that they'd sort of given up on when they moved away. So right. moving home, I think is a powerful theme. Yeah, yeah. I mean, whenever we're hurt or in trouble, who do we call, right? We call our moms. It's always the mom we turn to. So home is a special place. Right, although for him, it's sort of a flawed place because he has this, right. this very conflicted relationship with his father. And so there's this sort of meta narrative around mm -hmm. finding compassion for his father and being able to connect, maybe not to ever really gloss over or lionize his dad, but to recognize that he's, you know, kind of doing the best he could in a flawed sort of a way, just yeah. like the town was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. And if I could add, uh, you know, one thing, we don't really have a lot of development on this, but this is what I assume is that he was a different person when he was younger. And certainly his, I guess, girlfriend at the time is, it has this vision of him as, as he was. And so coming back, is bringing him back to where he was, which potentially was a better place than he was when he was in Miami, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Although one gets the picture that he was um, troubled as a, 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 as a young person growing up in that town, that he was not entirely happy with his life there. So it's not as though returning to, returning home was a return to his conception of an idyllic place. Uh, it, 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 and I'm not sure he knew why he was going back home. And I'm not sure that he knew what sort of unresolved business he had uh, uh, in going back home. So if I could say, so that sense of, um, you know, not knowing what he was resolving. So the redemption, is that, I mean, was redemption part of the motivation? Oh, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, those, those conversations Tatum has with his dad, those are conversations I had with my father because he left us when I was very young and our relationship was strained. And I, some of them are word for word. So it's really uncomfortable for me to read that book. <laughs> but yeah, it was just, I was filled with anger for a long time and I had to forgive him. And the way you forgive him is to come back home and you have to change as a person. So that's what Tatum went through. It's kind of what I had to get through to reestablish this connection to my dad. That was one of the questions I had, Victor, uh, for your fabulous book, was how much of this is your life? I know with a lot of my fiction, I see lines that I've said, I see my conversations with other people. How much of you is the book and how much of it is your creation? Yeah, a lot of it is me. You know, he's he's writing a uh, he's writing that book, Art of Jury Trial is War. Those are lessons I use in trial every day. And it's funny, the Dean mentioned he's a manipulator because he did a magic trick in front of the jury. I actually did that. <laughs> so, <laughs> count me in that camp too. So there's a lot in there. I basically revealed our secrets of, of how defense attorneys function. And I wanted people to really see what it's like because people ask me, what, it, what is it like to be a defense attorney? And it's, it's such a unique role in the law. It's not like being another lawyer. Um, I, I tell people that it's like taking a legal ethics exam every day, but you don't get time to study for it. Because that's really like, I'll, I'll give you an example, a case I recently had, the police didn't search my client very well. He had a gun in the small of his back. When he was cuffed in the police car, he took it out and tucked it between the seats, right? So he bails out and he calls me. He's like, I left my gun in the police car. What do we do? And so I'm freaking out. I have no idea. You know, the next guy that gets in that, he might shoot the cop. So I call our bar ethics hotline and they basically say, they're very polite, but they basically say like, we have no idea. Like you're gonna have to make the call. We have no idea what to do. So I have to get creative and, and come up with ways to solve these ethical problems. And I don't think any other lawyer, lawyer has that issue because to us, and that's really a theme I explore in the hollows, to a criminal lawyer, you want to have an obligation to society and justice, but the overriding emphasis is the duty to your client. 
you know, there's a case out of the Ninth Circuit where somebody's client kidnapped a young woman and stashed her somewhere without food and water. And um, the prosecution came to the attorney and said, you got to tell us where she is because the client had told the lawyer. And so the lawyer said, I can't do that. I can't betray my client. So they did an emergency appeal and the appellate court found that it would be sanctionable for the lawyer to reveal where this person was. So even at the cost of a life, we have to maintain our duty to our client. I don't think there's any other type of lawyer that has that. And so that's why it's such an ethical battle, battle every day, balancing justice and society with what I have to do for my clients to win this case. Okay, Victor, you can't leave us there. What did you say about the gun and <laughs> what would have Tatum said? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think Tatum would have done what I did. I called the chief of police and I said, so hypothetically, if I had a client that left the gun in a police car, again, hypothetically, if I told you where it was, would you hypothetically not arrest my client for it? And the police, the chief of police said, I would hypothetically rather have the gun than your client arrested. So I told him where it was. He kept his word and, and uh, my client didn't get arrested for it. So, uh, Cindy Tobisman, uh, uh, I'd like to follow up on on this tension here. Uh, so the and I think I'm going to uh, uh, ask uh, James Crank to 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 uh, weigh in on this as well. Uh, but. The principal protagonist is Tatum Graham, and um, he's a world-class criminal defense lawyer. And the first view of him is uh, uh, is in the courtroom, and he's doing a closing argument. And it's easy to see from the the picture that unfolds of him that uh, he has an almost cynical understanding of law. He's emotionless in some ways or emotionally shut down in some ways, very competitive, um, describes a jury trial as a, a kind of war and the lawyer's uh, uh, job is to master the arts of war. And, and the end of that mastery is not justice. It, it is uh, winning for one's client. Uh, so so uh, I wonder if you could talk about Tatum's journey over the course of the book and, and what light that sheds on uh, the connection of law to justice. I mean, I think this was one of the really interesting ruminations. You know, if every book is a bit of a kind of philosophical rumination on something and the characters embody different ways of positioning themselves in relation to it. It really seems like what Tatum's doing is he's, he's questioning what it is to win. You know, he's, he's devoted himself to becoming like the master samurai, like the Ronin who's out there who can kick anybody's butt um, and you hire him, you know, or, and, and he'll win it for you. And he's attained the absolute pinnacle of that definition of winning and it's empty. And, and that, you know, we say it's, it's unclear why he feels compelled to get in his car and drive back out West to where he's from. And in some sense, he's looking for, he's, he's hit a, an existential crisis and he's trying to redefine what does it mean to win? And the answer turns out to have something much more to do with justice than winning and that they're not the same thing. And, and that you know, for Atticus Finch, it's a recognition that you fight the good fight, you fight the just fight because it's just. You don't fight it because you're gonna win it. If you win it, great. But Atticus, I think, goes into uh, his defense uh, into Kill a Mockingbird, recognizing that he's functioning in a racist universe with racist decision makers, and that there's very little chance of actually winning. But the act of, of stepping over and sort of standing on the side of justice is itself the goal and that you, you win on a personal level when you do that. And so it's an interesting it's an interesting rumination because you have a character at the end of the day, though, who, who like you, is going to you know, he's going to end up uh, as a criminal defense attorney working for the state, which means he's going to play the cards he gets in each and individual every case he gets. Sometimes his client's going to be guilty. Sometimes his client's going to be innocent. Sometimes the best he's going to do is get a plea bargain for a guilty client. Who knows? But in some sense, he, 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 the story seems to be about redefining what it means to be winning. And, and, and it also it dovetails with ideas of wealth and poverty. I mean, he comes from this very luxurious existence and he goes to this much more modest uh, town that he's from. And so be interested to hear your thoughts on it, because obviously your trajectory 
you didn't have that. It seems like the thing that propelled you into the law was a sense of justice. Has that had any kind of friction points for you in, you know, as a criminal defense attorney where you don't really get, you don't get to choose who you represent. You just play the cards as you get them. Yeah, it's true. Wow, you guys are so much more insightful than me. It might be my best interest to just stay quiet the rest of the meeting. So, um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, it, it's every day a fight between justice and what I can do for my client. Absolutely. Um, the, every criminal defense lawyer has one type of case they don't take. I have a friend who won't take bad check cases. I don't know why he defends rapists and murderers, but a bad check case, he just like a string of profanity escapes his mouth and he kicks him out of his office. So everybody has that one case that really bugs them. Um, and so, uh, yeah, yeah, there is that, um, I, I think you're absolutely right that, uh, I came from, from, from it, from that perspective. Um, and so I had a, I didn't, when I first started, I didn't have a choice in who I defended. And so my sense of justice really got skewed because I was defending people that did the most horrific things you can imagine, but they needed a, they needed a lawyer. Like we were not the Soviet union. They have to have a defense. And so coming to terms with that was really difficult for me. And I think that's kind of what happens to Scout is that she sees in, in, injustice in the world and she has to learn to cope with it. Just like I had to learn to cope with it, you know, my first year out of, out of law school when I was defending these people. Can I jump in here too? And I just congratulations, Victor. I so enjoyed, okay. it's such a genuine pleasure to read your book. And this is what I kind of wanted to talk about because, you know, when you get to the point where you're, look, you know, you're reading some really amazing fiction, the margins between what is good and what is excellent is razor thin. And the thing that pushed the hallows over for me was exactly this, which is that to show the evolution of Tatum as a human. And part of that is coming to terms with the limits of what you can do and what one person can do. And I think that that is one of the threads that compels us about To Kill a Mockingbird. Look, I think we have this image of Atticus Finch as because of the Gregory Peckification of Atticus Finch as sort of almost this Clark Kent character ripping his, you know, suit open. And we have metonymically replaced that whole book with just that courtroom scene. Uh, and instead we forget that Atticus Finch was a deeply flawed uh, um, deeply conflicted and very cynical person. And he was cynical about the institutions. He was cynical about the systems. He was cynical about all, he wasn't cynical about the ideals behind it. He wasn't cynical about justice. And these were things that he lived, he learned to live them. And that's the evolution of Atticus Finch in that book. And it feels to me like there's a similar trajectory with Tatum, which is that, you know, he's, he's cynical about the systems of justice. He's cynical about the way that you can play this game and he's learning to play this game. And uh, one of the things that I loved so much was the art of war as I loved all of that because it felt like something um, that Atticus would do in his spare time. You know, he's constantly writing on little pieces of paper and stowing them places. And I'm thinking, this is one of the books that he's writing, right? Is like, this is connecting to war and so forth. And uh, I think you're absolutely right, Cindy. I mean, one of the things that he says after he loses that trial is, we knew we were going to lose that trial. We always knew we were going to lose that trial. But then there's an appeal and then there's this. So the, the, the notion of Atticus as some sort of Superman idealist, I mean, he think he says in the courtroom scene, I'm no idol, you know, I'm no idealist to think about these things. I'm, I'm someone that's just working. I'm a working man. And that's the other thing is that you, you, you have these moments where Tatum humanizes himself. It's not in the courtroom. It's not when the stakes are high. It's not when all of the lights are on and he's having to perform. It's when he's having to be human with other humans and talk about human things. And you can read a lot of books about law and about sort of the spectacle of the courtroom, but it's those moments, those small moments that make a book like The Hallows exceptional. And it truly was that, I think, that pushed it over the edge for me and connects it to Atticus Finch and Scout and all of those lessons. So congratulations. It was a great read. I think the, the insight about his evolving connection with other human beings is, 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 is a good one. Uh, it's only in chapter 32, I think, pretty far into the book that you, and this is right after, I think, Tatum has gone horseback riding and you can kind of feel him breathing in a way that you haven't sensed him breathing before, but there's a, there's a line in, in that, in chapter 32 that he smiled and it was the first smile that uh, 
I saw from him uh, in, in that book. Uh, and I think it is an emerging humanness that helps him to connect who he is as a professional and, and, and what he's doing uh, as a lawyer. I love, I love that point, both as, a, both as a practicing lawyer and as a writer, because it really is at the end of the day, how you do your job, not the job that you do. And if you can do it with a measure of humanity and you can connect to the people around you, then there's something gratifying on a soul deep level that just isn't there. I mean, you can be a technically very effective writer or very effective lawyer, and there's no soul in it. And I think one of the things that, that I really enjoyed about your book was there was just a lot of heart. You know, you, you have a lot of heart and it came across in your writing. Uh, you're a technically um, proficient writer. You write tightly. There's no wasted motion. Um, but the thing I agree uh, is that, you know, you really, you just, you wrote with a lot of heart. And, you know, for me, that pushed it over the edge. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot. One of the things that really changed me early in my career is I was defending a, uh, someone from a cartel, a Mexican cartel. And I mean, we're talking the huge dude, you know, muscles on his necks. He's got the fake tattoos and like really scary looking dude. And I, I went back to the attorney client room during court to talk to him and he was just weeping like uncontrollably. And I said, Hey, what's wrong? And he said, you're the first person in my life. That's been nice to me. And that really like affected me like, wow, some of these people have never had someone show them kindness and I'm showing them kindness. Like maybe that can have a massive effect. So that's really when I fell in love with this, the profession of the laws, the power that we have to show people that there's someone out there who cares for them. Yeah, my, my favorite mediation I ever attended was one where I, I got to, you know, because I'm an appellate lawyer, I actually ended up kind of handicapping both sides. I went to both rooms and I looked at one side and I said, you know, you'd be a very sympathetic witness, but the people in the other room would be also. And here's how your next two, year, two years of your life is gonna go. If you decide you wanna keep fighting about this case, you're gonna be at odds with your stepsister, you're gonna be at odds with your mother, you're gonna spend nights worrying, or you can just put this aside. I mean, is this worth it? I went for both sides, they settled the case. I mean, but I thought, you know, this is like, here's real life, here's what's really gonna happen with you. And it was, it was gratifying because at the end of the day, the law is a tool to help people. It's not this thing that exists outside of people's lives. And, uh, and, and I love that intersection in your book where he stops seeing it as just, you know, I'm the lawyer par excellence and therefore I've, I've achieved everything. He becomes a lawyer who's interested in mentoring the next generation. He's a lawyer who's interested in being a part of his community. And, and that's, you know, you know he's gonna be okay at the end of the story because of those things. Can I just, just uh, what Cindy just said about mentoring the next generation, it really, the other characters really were interesting. The young investigator, was that, how much of that was you? How much of that was other people who you've mentored? I'm sure it's some of both, but it was interesting that you purposely put those kinds of characters in. Yeah, those are people I've had work for me. So very, very similar people. And uh, seeing their evolution was one of the great, um, you know, joys of my practice, seeing someone go in completely green, not understanding how the world works, you know, uh, the government's always right, <laughs> like, we're, like we're told in school, and then seeing them change to, holy crap, I can't believe the police did that, to, that's a, that's a really fantastic thing to watch, to see someone come to terms with injustice in the world and learn what to do about it, and still have faith. That's, that's what I love about To Kill a Mockingbird, is at the end, Jem is Jem is really disillusioned, if I remember right. I think he's just disillusioned with everything that happened. But Scout isn't. Scout still has faith that people are good, despite the injustice. And that's what I try to teach the younger lawyers that work for me, is that, yes, there's injustice. Yes, there's horrible things. But we got to fight anyway. We got to do the best we can anyway. So, David Mao, if I can come back to you, uh, uh, maybe come full circle, uh, th there's, there is this theme about justice and uh, the, 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 the tensions that are built into the justice seeking role of a lawyer. But there's also, and I think this goes back to something that Jesse Holland had said earlier about the kind of, the, there's the courtroom drama, legal thriller, and then there's the um, outside the courtroom role of the lawyer. And uh, so much of this book focuses on the kind of uh, 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 um, humble, <laughs> uh, difficult, sometimes mundane role of preparing for 
trial. Uh, and, and you as an administrator, I know, can appreciate <laughs> Can appreciate that. So I wonder if you could reflect on uh, the, the the that that um, the inglorious uh, and, and often hidden uh, uh, job of uh, of being a lawyer and its connection to law as a profession and law as an institution, for that matter. Well, yeah, sure, certainly, and I think you're absolutely right. It is a lot of the steps. It's not just the uh, summation at the end of trial or even in the opening statement that we see a lot in popular media. There are a lot of things that go along with the actual practice of law, um, you know, whether it be criminal, like in, in this case, or even a civil, um, you know, all of these things that need to that we need to do um, to establish a case and um, that preparation, that step by step mundane, as you say, little tasks that need to happen, um, all leading up to ultimate, whether it be a trial or, or, or whatever. Um, but it's part of that process. And it's important, I think, for people to know that because it is that protection that, that shows that you're not, surpri- you're not trying to su- surprise anybody. I mean, despite the art of war and trying to make it a game, um, it really is, is the, the, the right of process, the, the duty that we have to make sure everybody has the right information, whether it's from your side or the opposing counsel to know what's gonna happen and what, so you're not ambushed at the very end so that there is a deliberation and a true um, understanding that the law is actually doing what it's supposed to be doing and making the right decision. And I also like that the, 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 the way that you handle the profession of law, you know, extends into, we're talking about heart and the tender moments that, you know, you start with a guy on top of his profession, but at the bottom of who he is as a human. And, you know, the questions he asked himself, you know, you're a great lawyer, you have, you're a great professional, that's, that's rad. How are you a good son? Are you a good neighbor? Are you a good steward of your community? Are you a good, um, you know, uh, person that, whatever, what, what, all these other roles that you fill as just being a person, that's kind of the existential crisis of Tatum is that he has to come into contact with that. And it's another thing that connects me with Atticus because Atticus um, it struggles with being a father. He struggles with being a good father. Again, we think of him as the best father in the world. We name dogs after him in Alabama or whatever, but, but he's not a great dad in a lot of scenes. I mean, there are a lot of ways in which he fails his children. There are a lot of things he's not present for. He has to ask himself hard questions and he has to struggle with the limits of his profession. And I think we forget too, at the end of Mockingbird, the thing he has to decide to do is to break the law, to not report the fact that uh, Boo Radley killed, uh, killed the man that attacked Scout. And so, and, and that's, as a lawyer that's following by the book, that's a professional lawyer, that's something that he would never do. And yet he has to be human and a good father and a good steward and a good neighbor in that moment. And he realizes there's there's a limit to being a professional and that limit is your humanity. And I really feel that with Tatum because especially in those scenes with his father uh, and in and, and the scenes where he goes back to his hometown, he has to ask himself those questions. Um, and so I'm wondering, are you, when you think about Mockingbird and its kind of relationship to you and and Nell and all of these, were you drawing from some of that humanity or were you thinking about those scenes at all when you were uh, crafting, not even when you're starting writing, but when you're thinking about the trajectory of the book, was that something that you were conscious of or was it something that just happened in the midst of writing it? And that's a, that's a great way to tee up uh, uh, a conclusion to our conversation. So, uh, uh, Victor Mithos, I'm going to give you the last word, and this is a great way of, of, of offering uh, final words about, about the novel and its connection to, to Kill a Mockingbird, to Go Set a Watchman, uh, to uh, Harper Lee. Yeah. Well, like I said in that, in the acceptance, I mean, I can't overstate how big of an influence To Kill a Mockingbird was for me. I mean, on the one hand, I had my friend who was unlawfully arrested and had to go through the justice system. And then I stumbled upon To Kill a Mockingbird and discovered what a defense lawyer was. On the other hand, my dad left us when I was very young. I had no male role models. And so Atticus Finch and, and Hemingway became became my role models. Luckily, I, I let loose the, the Hemingway macho BS and Atticus stuck with me. So, <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, I really wanted a book about this lawyer that uses the law to change himself because that's ultimately what I've done. 
Um, and a lot of the themes in To Kill a Mockingbird, tragically, we're seeing today on the news. You turn on the news and it's the same stuff you're seeing, something that defense attorneys have been ringing the bell on for 40 years and something that, that I think ultimately it will be the lawyers that solve. Um, you know, and it, like inherent bias is an extraordinarily difficult thing to overcome. I know some police officers that I would consider very moral, good men um, that, that don't consider themselves racist, that, that love everybody, but yet they pull over African-Americans at three or four times the rate that they pull over white people for the same offense. And so inherent bias takes years of training to get over, but we need a solution now. And defense attorneys, uh, you know, have really come forward with um, some, some really interesting solutions like uh, technology. I really think technology is the key for right now. Number one, every cop should have a body cam um, and the federal government should pay for it so that the, it's not a burden on the community. There's no reason for a cop not to have a body cam. And number two is investing in the tech, uh, non-lethal tech. There's a great company I follow called Warp Technologies. They make a gun that you fire, it shoots a metal cord out and it wraps around the person's arm and drops them like on a cartoon. And so the problem with the shootings are is that tasers have a limited range and then they go to the gun immediately after. But Warp Technologies gun actually goes as far as the gun and could save people's lives. So, so I would say that we need to listen to the people that are in the system right now. And it's usually defense lawyers and the prosecutors. Um, and every defense lawyer I've talked to says, we, gotta rever we, got, we got technology, we have to turn to technology to solve these issues that we're having. And so I think To Kill a Mockingbird, honestly, is more relevant today than it ever was in its own time. So thank you for uh, tying this conversation to present day uh, critical uh, in, uh, issues related to social justice. And they're, 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 of course, not just present day. They've been with us for, uh, in this country, centuries. Uh, and, uh, but, but I think we've seen with clarity the need to address them. And it's, uh, great to be able to see the ways in which the vision of uh, a lawyer and the vision of uh, a novelist can uh, help us clarify our own duty. So to, to our panelists, this has been a really stimulating conversation. Thank you for your role in uh, judging, for your role in this conversation. To Victor Mithos, uh, congratulations. Uh, very worthy uh, novel and winner Thank of the prize. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And with that, we're adjourned. Thank you. Take care. Be well. Mm -hmm.